So today we are continuing to speak. Today we are continuing to speak about need finding. And in particular, we will try to see all these methods reported in the slides, um, starting from observation. We are not going to ask you, sorry, if you want to speak, there is space outside of the room. Hello? So, uh, we can continue to speak about need finding, and in particular, we'll start from observation. We are not going to ask you to do all these need finding methods in your project. We will ask you probably to use two of them, one in assignment one and another in assignment two. But let's start with observation. So observation stem from the ethnographic observation. That is that kind of observation that you can, you, you maybe have seen in some books, read in some books or in some documentary, where a person is going somewhere else in the world, living with indigenous people, etc., for a month. Living with them for a month to observe their style of living, their habits, etc. That is observation. That is the same observation we can imagine here. We can do that if we want, living with a person for six months to understand the way of living is not really practical and quick, but still is part of the observation. So embed ourselves in the people, environment, culture, and behavior to obtain data, to extract needs again, to influence uh, definition of a system, to influence the requirements of a system, etc. And also, in doing observation, we also learn the language, the terminology that otherwise we could have missed. And most importantly, we also learn about any tricks that they have in place with their processes. So they do something in their life, imagine a process, a more structured process, like, I don't know, um, nurses filling out form, or doctors needing to perform a specific activity. You will also learn what is working in the current process, what is not, and what they are doing to make it work, even if the system maybe is not supportive, but let's say you, if you click there and then you change, you click another place and then you click in another place again, you will reach the screen uh, that you, you don't know how to reach uh, in, an, in, other, in other ways. So all these tricks are also something that you can only observe. You can all interview people to understand their tricks in their work. There are subtle changes in the process, the theoretical process, and how they implement in practice the theoretical process. Uh, ethnogra observation is always a matter of listening and observing, almost never speaking, talking, asking questions. You are just there to observe, to listen to people, to watch people doing things. Uh, typically is audio or video recorded and the observer take notes of what happens. Uh, and it has three risks, and one huge disadvantage. The disadvantage is that you have, you have to have something to observe. So if it's a very specific activity, like uh, students, um, people that live together, that needs to organize their week grocery shopping, or the cleaning of the house, etc., you have a specific moment to observe, the moment in which the organization is unfold, but if you have to observe how an event manager organizes event, it's more difficult to find a specific moment in their life, because the organization of our events can take one year of small hours here and there. 
So this is a, a drawback of observation. You need to have a specific activity to observe. And if you want to observe an activity that spans several months or years, you should ideally, in theory, go living with this person for all this time. Hmm? Uh, and this is the huge disadvantage of observation. Uh, but there are activities, again, people that live together that organize their weeks, or students uh, taking notes in a lecture. Hmm? Specific activity, more time constraint, that are easy, easier to observe. But even in this case, observation has three risks. The first one is to misinterpret observation. You observe something, and you think to derive, you derive some, something from the thing that you observe, but maybe is a misinterpretation of you. It's a misinterpretation given by your context, given by your bias that we, we introduced last time, given by many other things. So that is a risk that exists in every observation, especially the short one, because in the longer one, you maybe see the same activity repeated more and more time, so you can refine the observation. Uh, there is another risk that is the disrupting the activity. The fact that a person is there looking at you while you're doing some activity can change how you do the activity. It's like having one person behind you looking at you, whatever you do. You maybe don't act totally naturally. You maybe change some activities, change some things you do. Or you don't do something, just not, not to be observed, to be observed. So that is a risk to minimize and also connect to the first one, overlooking important information. You observe something and you decide it is not important. Again, according to your own perception and according to what is your experience, your context. So what we learn by observation when done well and when minimizing this risk and when it's possible because the activity is clear or we can spend months, years living together a people, a person that we typically cannot, uh, is what do people do now? We can well understand what you are doing now. So which are the problems, the positive points of the activity in, uh, in ACT, also the needs of the activities. Uh, what values and goal people have in doing some specific activity or in living a part of their life. Uh, if we are looking at a larger, especially if we're looking at the larger scope, which are the activities in this larger context and how these activities fit a larger context. Are they sequential? Are they contradictory? Are they done periodically, etc.? And you can also observe, if you observe more people, similarity and differences across people doing the same activities. And you can also learn, if it's an observation well done, how the context changed the activity. For instance, how the time of the day change an activity. So pick one activity done in the morning is the same than done the, the, this activity in the evening or in the night. Do an activity alone with calm in a weekday is the same activity done in the same exact way than maybe in a more crowded, more noisy environment it clearly depends from the activities, but many activities can be um, influenced by contextual information, contextual things that happen. And what we learn, especially with the observation, is the unspoken knowledge. Things that you maybe don't remember, you don't say, let's say in an interview, but you can observe because it's done in that moment. And also, we learn the difference. We learn the process in theory and the process in practice. Hmm? So again, let's use the example that we did last time. If we want to book, to enroll in a specific exam date, or you want to change your study plan, in theory, the process is one. In practice, 
there is a one-to-one -one match with the theoretical process, or there are tricks, workaround, information that you learned from your experience, from others, that doesn't reflect officially the theoretical process. Maybe because the theoretical process is not well explained, or maybe because you can change the study plan only in some period and not in others. And if you want to change in others, you have to do additional steps. Uh, or enrolling to exam, which is the process to enroll in an exam. What do you need to do to enroll in an exam? Go to the portal. Log into the portal. Look for a specific section. And choose between the exams. Do you agree? Is anything missing in this? Yeah, you need to choose the, you, you need to, to have the course in the, your study plan. Another thing is missing. You can enroll in an exam in any moment of the year. No, you have periods in which you can enroll to a specific exam. So if we describe the, the process in this way, oh, you have to go to the portal, click on the exam session, and then enroll to the exam, we are missing information. Like, okay, I, have, I need to have the exam in the study plan, and there is a specific period to enroll in the exam. And if I, outside of that period, can I enroll to the exam? Yes or no, or maybe? Who say no? OK, say yes. Now, the rest is unclear. You can, actually. No, you cannot, but the teacher can. I can enroll you in an exam after the date of the, after the exam close in the, on, the portal, on, the portal, on the portal. So the teacher can either remove students after the deadline. So you cannot, clearly, but if the teacher is nice enough, it can do it for you. So this is an information that you can learn from the field. Oh, I forgot to, to enroll to the exam. I can ask the teacher to do this. Then the teacher will say no, but they can at least ask, ask for this. And this is not something that you have in the set of process. Yeah, what happens if your exam overlaps probably could be a part of the, it's not a part of the enrollment process because you, you enrolled in any way. That it's a problem of being in the same room, in different room at the same time. But this is more a problem of practice. What happens if? So this is our things that you can learn by observation. And there are two types of observation mainly. Uh, let me start from the others. That is the easiest one. Uh, not, the first one is the naturalistic observation. And the one that resembles what I told you, you, you can see in a documentary or again in a book. Uh, you go where the people are and you, let's say, live with them. Hmm? So you want to observe how the secretary of Polytechnic works. You go there together for one day, for half a day, and see all the activities that they do, how they do, etc. This is naturalistic. You go where the action is. And it has some advantages and disadvantages as definition. It's surely more reliable because you see the work in practice when it happens. It's also more useful for ideation because you are really inserted in the context. So you see things that happens, not happens the relationship between people. You notice a lot of things. However, it's also difficult to include a representative example, sample of people. Because you go there. There are three people in the room. And you had those three people. They could be the best one, the worst one, average. Who knows? They should, can be tasked with a specific task for that day and totally different another day. And you don't know. You cannot 
design it to have a representative sample of people or a representative sample of activities. You get what you get in that moment because it's naturalistic. You don't control it, any of it. You just go there. And clearly, it's difficult to make it replicable for the same reason. And similarly, in a naturalistic observation, it's hard to manipulate any variable that are external to the things that you're observing. And so here, there is an example. If it's raining, when you observe your user working on a smartphone, their behavior is likely to be different when it's sunny. Clearly, if you're outside, not inside. And you cannot control the weather. If, that day, if one day is raining and the other day is sunny, and you have to do an experiment outside, an observation outside with workers, their behavior will be clearly different according to the weather. And you cannot control it. So this is the naturalistic observation. Uh, the other type on the other side is the controlled observation, in which you don't go in the environment. You ask people to come in. So you don't go to watch secretary, how they work. You don't go watching worker, how they work. You ask worker to came where you are. You ask the secretary to come where you are. And you have set up an environment that resembles the environment that they have. But you have control on what happens, because you set up everything. So this is easy to reproduce. Do you want it multiple times? You have the same environment, just involve multiple people. Uh, it's easy to analyze, because you control everything. You control the environment, you control the computers, you control the task, you control the activities. You know when a person is coming in or not, and how many people you have in the room. It is uh, clearly quicker than the other to conduct. Hmm? Uh, you need to, to spend a little bit of time for recruitment, and then the observation is fast because you pick a person and give them an activity that is their natural, normal activity, and then you observe. And then you say goodbye. Uh, but you have also, in this case, the Ultron effect that you also have in the naturalistic case a little bit, that is the act of observation of how someone does something can change how they do it. This is a specific name, uh, but it's what I told you before. When you lo look at somebody doing an activity, this person can change how the activity is done because you're looking at it, at him. And similarly, there are two extreme ways to be observer. Because these are two kinds of observation. And then you are the observer. And there are two types of observer. Extreme. And then there is also something in the middle. It's not, this is black and white. And all the shades of gray are in the middle and are possible. So on one side, you have the complete observer. And on the other side, you have the complete participant. So the complete observer is becoming part of the wall. In both cases, in both kinds of observation, you just observe. You don't say anything. You don't record anything. You don't do anything. Just be there, look at the proper distance, not too close to avoid the Ultron effect. You don't record anything. You don't interrupt. You leave the person doing whatever they want to do. And then you schedule time for discussing your observation. These are some advantages. This minimizes the Ultron effect, because you are part of the wall. Not, you don't paint yourself as the wall, but you are still a complete observer. You don't do anything, not even record, video record, audio record, just not to put a camera in front of the person or in the back of the person. You try not to change the environment at all. Minimum invasion. And this is one side, one extreme. 
the other stream is becoming one of them, like a spy, a complete participant. You want to observe secretary, you become one. You want to observe nurses, you, for one day, for that moment, you become one of the nurses. You go do an activity with them, clearly the activity that you can do. So you undergo the training process, all the official information, all the information shared between co-workers at coffee breaks, etc. everything. You observe everything. You are one of them. You also do something of the things that you observe. And also in this case, you validate after the observation with the others. And these are the two extremes. So on one side, you have a complete observer disappear from the room. And on the other side, you are one of them, like an undercover observer, which you do everything. In most cases, with a complete participant, you don't even tell the others that you are observing them. I'm a new recruiter, a new, a new person that is recruited, just learning the job with you. So these are the two extremes. And then there are things in the middle that clearly, moving away from the complete observer, you can introduce the Orton effect, you can introduce other variables. And moving away from the complete participants, you have more uh, attachment. You are less attached to the role, to the place, because you are observing and not participating in it. So these are, again, the two extreme, and mean alternative in the middles are possible, and typically what one does is something in between. More typically on the, say, in the side of the observer in HCI, but not the complete observer, like part of the wall. Uh, which data you can collect from observation? You can collect impression. You can, after the observation, if you ask a question, you can collect a ranking, ratings by the user. You can write summary report. You can take pictures of artifacts. You can take notes of hints in the workspace. So artifacts means whatever that, is, that they are using to do an activity. Maybe it's something physical. Maybe it's something uh, on the computer. They have a process, then they open another software to do a part of the process, and they go back. That a picture of that, a note of that, other software could be an artifact in this case. And these are subjective data. And then you have more objective data, like the observed workaround, the observed errors, the critical incident, etc. So some of these things are extremely important when you are redesigning a system, other are less important when you are creating the same are less important when you are creating a new system. So if you are redesigning a system, the observed error and the observed workaround are essential because you want to redesign it without having, again, the same errors and having the same workaround, the same tricks. If you are creating from scratch, you can keep them in mind, just not to repeat but they are not maybe really linked with the actual product that they are using because you don't want to redesign that. You want to do something different. So, but this is all the data you can collect from observation. You are, it's not that you have to collect all of them, but this is the data you can collect to extract needs, to extract behaviors, to extract information from that. And this is observation. You go there, observe people. You don't speak with people too much, maybe after the observation, just to clarify. And then, connected, let's say, to observation, there are diaries. Diaries that takes the name from the physical book, from a diary. Uh, because as you as I said, observation work very well for a specific activity. Have some problem if you need to observe a longer activity or a not specified activity or an activity that lasts one year. Again, I want to plan an event. 
is not something that they do today, for next year, for September 2023. It's not something they do all today. Maybe I do some calls today, maybe I do some planning tomorrow, maybe next week I'll do other things, etc. So if we're going to observe all of this, it's going to be extremely complicated and requiring a lot of time. So to avoid this, diaries are an alternative for longer observation period. Because again, sometimes observing long period of time is not possible or not des desirable. So what are diaries? Diaries are tools, sometimes on paper, sometimes computer-based, that require people to take notes of directions, to keep a diary of the activity they are doing. And these notes can be taken in two moments in time, when they perform a specific action on at a certain time, hour, day, etc. So you are not observing, but you are giving people something like this. This is actually a diary, using a study, in a diary study. You give them something like this, with instructions, how to fill the diary out, and ask them, please fill it every day at 8 a.m. or every time you want to do this, or you are doing this. And they need to keep the diary and write on the diary something. This is good for a lot a longer observation, also with various activities, and also for getting insight on, uh, on the life in general or daily life of a person. Hmm? Because you can leave the diary there for one month, for six months, and ask people to write on the diary every single day or every time something happens. So, which is the problem on a participant perspective with diary to you? Is this something that you will be happy to do for the next year? No, that's the main problem with diaries. Diaries are requiring a lot of efforts from the participants. While observation are not, because you are just observing people, so they are doing their work. Maybe you ask them to came for one hour, two hours, and then it's done. Here is something that they have to remember to do. So you need stronger motivation for keep a diary. And what is sometimes happening is that people receive incentives to keep a diary. There could be money. You are paid to keep a diary for three months, or a prize in the end, or a benefit. Something that gives you a stronger motivation than please do it for us, because you are so nice. It becomes please do it for us because we pay you. So maybe some people are more motivated than not just doing for you a favor. So here there is a stronger motivation. Clearly paying people, giving incentives to people can bring in other kind of problem. Like they do it for the money, not doing well. They just do it. So the quality can change because you are motivating people by giving stuff and not for the activity. So maybe they do it, but very, very badly. But if they do it, they get money, so they continue to do it. So the quality is then a problem, something to keep in mind with diaries. Um, and then the diaries need to be collected and analyzed by the researcher, by the designer, uh, whatever, either offline independently after the data collection or in the context of an interview. You do a three-month diary, and then you go visit these people, and one at a time, you get the diary back if it's on paper, and you ask them some question. You look at the diary together with them, and something like this. 
Uh, here there is an example of a diary on paper, but diaries could be also electronic, and sometimes are easier to do electronically uh, because you don't need to keep this with, with you. Mm? So if you imagine a diary like a smartphone app that sends you a notification in the right moment, and then you have to fill out a form with yes, no, some closed question, that it's easier than keep with you this piece of paper wherever you are in, in the world and write on it. Hmm? Uh, but again, this was an actually diary study done for a month uh, in the home. Hmm? So people in the home had this diary and they need to uh, write any possible automation rules that they can think of in their house for periods of month hmm? with low incentives in this case. They were nice enough to, and we did it uh, for 16 households in parallel. So you release 16 diaries for three months, let's say, 20 diaries for three months, and then at the end of three months, you collect all of them. So this is good for longer observation, but it clearly has those drawbacks. But when, you're, when you want to observe people for a long period of time, you either go living with them, or you need alternative ways like a diary on paper or electronic based to actually collect the data for a long period of time. Hmm? There is no really other alternative. So you have to, to pick the one that is best for you, for the context, for the system, for the capability and the, uh, and the, the I would say the amount of money or the other requirements that you have, other capabilities that you have, including incentives. And then, so observation, observing people, diary, having people write down what they, what they do, interviews. Interviews can be split in, uh, let's say, two form. Uh, one are the one-to-one -one interviews the one that we are used to see also on television. Um, so three types. Interviews one-to-one. -one. Interviews one-to-many. And then survey or questionnaire. So in-person interviews, what's called the in-person interviews, includes interviews one-to-one, -one, that are the classical interview, when you have one person that asks questions and the other person that replies. Or one to many that are called focus group, in which there is one person that asks and five, six people that can reply. And that's one type. The other types are questionnaire, also called survey that are made by questionnaire, so you don't have to speak with the people in person or remotely, but you don't have to speak synchronously. Surveys can be done asynchronously. You release a Google form to all the students to collect information, like we did for um, the preferences of the teams. That could be a very, very, very simple survey to collect information, not to collect need, but to collect information. And while observation and diaries uh, are typically used for need finding only, or mostly, uh, interviews, and especially survey, can also be used to validate something, especially surveys, especially the electronic one. Because you can put a video of an application and then ask questions. You can show something and ask questions for understanding what is working, what is not. So you're not really Instructing needs in those cases, but you are still getting information from people about something. Now about the interview, about needs or requirements, and in other moments about a first prototype of something. In person, let's say one to one or one to many interviews are clearly time demanding. Why are they time demanding? 
where an interview is time demanding and the survey is fast. Yes, because I, I need to ask separate people, to ask him the same question to separate people. So I need to schedule an interview with him, then do the interview, then schedule an interview with him in another day, maybe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if I want to interview 10 people, I have to schedule 10 interviews and conduct 10 interviews of half an hour long. So five hours spread in two weeks. Survey, I prepare the survey, and I tell all of you, please fill out. And after one week, or the same two weeks as before, I don't get five interviews, I get 100 responses. So they are faster, because once prepared, they can be done. Interviews, however, allow us to have an in-depth knowledge that survey doesn't allow us to have. Again, why? To you. You can, yes, you can adapt to the interview. You can ask questions, and then according to the answer, you can ask another question. You can follow up. They're called, the question that came after the, another question is called follow up question. Hmm? I'm following up with another question that is connected to the first one, and, but still not something that I thought about it. Uh, instead, we, I cannot do this for the surveys, because surveys are, I, I define 10 questions, and they are. And also, interviews allow us to have open-ended questions, while typically survey doesn't have a lot of open-ended questions. Just more check these, rank these, more activities of this kind, not write these. Um, so surveys are a set of questions with predefinite possible answer and are typically paper-based or more frequently nowadays online. Uh, interviews instead can be uh, split between structured and unstructured, and semi-structured in the middle. Uh, what is the difference between structured and structured to you? And a structured. Yes, structured interviews are interviews that you have a list of questions, and similar to survey, you ask only those questions. You don't do a lot of follow-up questions, because it's really structured. You have 10 questions, you try to do all that 10 questions, whatever it happens. This is structured. Unstructured is instead, let's speak about something. You have some plan in mind, you have some question in mind, but it's more free. And indeed, the most, let's say, probably frequent case of uh, interviews are the one called semi-structured, in which you have a set of questions that you prepared, and then, that is a structured part, and then you have the unstructured parts that are the follow-up questions, the questions that you skip, because maybe it's already answered, the questions that came out to your mind according to the conversation in place, etc. So this, again, two extremes, structured and unstructured, and then something in the middle that is the same structured interviews. And this apply both to one-to-one -to -one interviews and focus group. Uh, where to focus group, there is one more challenge that is to you. Not in terms of questions, in terms of execution. Coordinating people, it's yes. What do you mean con coordinating with coordinating? Like yes, they shouldn't overlap and should have constructive. Uh, yes, that's one thing. And something else? Some yes, yeah, some people can influence the answer of the others. Something else? The size. Yeah, oh, yes, in focus group, you have more people uh, than the interviews. Yeah. 
in interviews one one, you are just you and the person speaking. And the person, let's say, cannot not speak. You are asking question. It's, this person has to reply at a certain point. When you have focus group with five people, you may be, you can have in the group, let's say five people, you can have in the group, yes, you have to coordinate, et cetera, all the things that you, you said, but you can also have in the group the shy one, an exuberant one. So one challenge in the focus group for the person that is doing the interviews is to avoid that is always the same person that reply to all questions and the other be quiet. You have to manage people because you are asking a question to everybody and if it's only the same person replying, so like here, I'm asking question and always the three or four of you reply. That is something that is not acceptable in a focus group because I want to hear about the others also, not only about the one that wants to reply. Hmm? So this could be acceptable in a classroom like this but not, totally not acceptable in a focus group because otherwise I'm doing the photo group, focus group only with the people that answer. That is one problem with the focus group. So it's the person that does the question, ask the questions that should be able to say, okay, now let's ask to somebody else the same questions to motivate the other to answer. And the other thing is partially came out from you. The other things in a focus group is that you can have one person influenced by the answer of the other. Like, oh yes, I agree with him or with her. Even if it's maybe not 100% true. Even if this person had something else in mind before listening to the other answer. Maybe the, maybe the answer was 90% similar to, to this other, but not 100. And Given that another person replied something similar, I'm not replying anymore. Say so I'm missing my small contribution. Maybe small, but still my small contribution. They could have instead informed some needs, some details that are missing in the conversation. So these are the challenges of focus group. Clearly focus group are faster, again, than interviews because you do it one hour, six people, instead of one hour, one person. So this is in general. Uh, we, now we are going to stop speaking about focus group, distinguish between focus group as an interview, given this uh, distinction we made. We will speak a little bit about surveys because they are a different uh, setting. And there is this warning, we already, I already told you this, that typically people don't know what they want even if they think to know what they want. And again, our goal here is not to, if we, we will use interviews for need finding, is not finding the wants, we want to find the needs. So some people is also, um, would like to do a good impression with you, so they will tell you what, you think, what they think you will like to hear. Especially, this happens especially when you have something new, some new technology, some new processes, something that is, let's say, disruptive, instead of more traditional processes or activities. And many times, they take the current context for granted. We always have done this, because yes, and we need these because yes, because why not? We already, we, we are doing this way. And maybe it's not something that is currently uh, okay or something that you cannot change, but they are used to. So they don't want to change, even if the change could be beneficial for the process, for others, etc. The context, is something that you don't understand with interviews, but you understand with observation, because you ask people to tell you, not to show you, to tell you, just speaking. And also they will tell you what they remember. So which participant we can choose for interviews? 
this all supply, clearly this all supply for observation, but more specifically for interviews, because for observation you have something to observe. Uh, for interviews you have something to listen, and everybody can speak or communicate. So when you're interviewing, you should try to keep uh, all the possible stakeholders represented. Which means the, let's say, average, we can call it in this way, user. But it also could mean the extreme user or the domain expert. So in the first assignment, you will see this example. Uh, this was actually done. There was a company called IDEO that uh, was tasked to redesign the shopping cart for a place. So they do some interviews, clearly, to redesign the shopping cart. And they didn't only speak with the people going shopping once per week, but they also um, speak with the extreme user that are the personal shopper in that context. So people that shop for others. That are extreme user because it's not the, the most common user that goes shopping in those places, but it's something that is paid for shopping for you. So it's extreme on, that, on one side. And also speak with domain expert. So the people that currently oversee in the company the shopping processes. So all of these are stakeholders in the shopping domain, not just the people doing shopping habitually. Also the people in the place, in the industry, in the company, and these extreme stakeholders when they are, and after they are. So try to have a representation of all stakeholders. Uh, if you are analyzing a specific system and you don't have enough people from that system, it's not something that happens now here, but Try to have, if you cannot have users of that system, uh, imagine you want to redesign the Train Italia system hmm, for booking. Uh, maybe you don't find enough Train Italia users, but you can find Italo users. That is not the same system, but it's similar. So something that you can learn also from, from this. Uh, in some cases, you can also have non user when you have designing something new that doesn't exist. And sometimes you need to approximate with similar users. Hmm? So maybe you don't find, again, Trinitali users. It's a famous example. You don't find Trinitali users, but you can speak with uh, GTT users, or Trainord users, or ATM users. Hmm? So transport, public transport, if it's not trained, not trained like Trinitalia or Italo, but still similar. Uh, if you don't fin find any user of your specific target. But it sometimes happens, but not so often. Then, to execute interview, you have to schedule a time, a place comfortable for the interviews. Uh, and interviews are, I don't remember, no I don't. And interviews are often structured as a story. As a story like once upon a time, etc. So without the once upon a time part, but all the stories start with an introduction, the background, what happens, where we are. Once upon a time there was Cinderella doing whatever. We start with the context. And then something happens. Hmm? In the story, we typically have an enemy, we have a negative characters, etc. And then there is the key moment in the story in which something happens, and then we have the conclusion. Hmm? So interviews are oftentimes structured in the same way. You start with the ground, the context, introducing yourself, telling them why you are there which is the goal of the conversation. And then as the conversation moves, you want to reach the climax of the interviews where you get most of the information and then at that point you can conclude with they live, they live happily even after. So 
schedule a time and a place comfortable with the user. Think about this story-based uh, narration of the interview in total. And first of all, introduce yourself, explain why you're there, and telling them that you are not testing them, especially if you are interviewing about something that already exists. You want to learn how they use X. So you're not there to judge them. But actually, they are helping you. Uh, begin with open-ended questions, always. And then move with more general at the beginning, more specific towards the end of the interviews. Unbiased when possible, and we will see what means with uh, unbiased. Uh, and then, really, really important, ask the questions and shut up. Let them answer. Give them time to answer. Don't pressure them to answer. Even if there is silence, it's fine. Let's stay in silence for a while. At a certain point, they will say something. So give always enough time. Give them time to reply once and then change a little bit their mind or reply twice. It's fine. Most of the time, the second answer is better than the first one because people have time to reflect on the things while they are saying that. So this is critical, ask and wait. Ask and be silent. Wait for the answer, don't interrupt, don't push people to answer. And if it's semi-structured, especially if it's semi-structured, follow up with related questions. And go in depth when you find an interesting point. Maybe it's not a question that you plan for, but the answer is say, oh, this is interesting, let's understand more. And so go down in that direction to understand more. So guidelines for questions. So the structure is not so difficult. Hmm? Start with introduction, purpose, open-ended open questions, more general at the beginning, always more specific towards the end, and then conclude and say thank you, and offer them a coffee or whatever. But which questions are we going to ask? What makes a good question or a bad question for an interview? So guidelines and bad versus good questions. So guidelines for questions, structured questions are easier to process. Unstructured, open-ended questions solicit more comments. That's why we started with open-ended questions to introduce the story, to get the context, to understand how people are in that specific moment, in that conversation. Open-ended question, unstructured. Structured questions are instead questions like, on a scale from one to five, how do you think that this is easy? Let's imagine this. Oh, how, do, how much do you agree with the other answer or the previous answer, with these aspects, with this sentence? These are more structured because you give a part and say, okay, rate me, rate this part. This is clearly structured, are easier because you have to pick a number. But even in this case, rate the question, rate the sentence between one and five. What is one? What is five? One is terrible and five is excellent, or vice versa? And if they say four, what is four? So try to understand what they mean. So if you ask rate in a scale, in a scale one to five, specify you which is one, what is one and what is five. One is bad and five is excellent. But then if they replied four, ask them what they mean with four. Why is four and not three and not five, not five? Because their perception of excellent could be different from yours. So try always to understand a little bit. 
uh, use the language of the person you're speaking with. If you're speaking with children, use that language. If you're speaking with doctor, ask things with the proper language. If you're speaking about medical things. Or try to understand which are these things. Uh, always better to prefer direct, concrete, specific questions because you, give, you have detailed answer after, hmm? but not general. General question is fine at the beginning and then moving forward. More specific, the better. And when you try, clearly you have to write down the questions, the structured part of the questions. You have to come up with a plan. I'm going to ask these 10 questions. Hmm? And always try the questions some friends, some family, just to understand if, if they are understandable. If everybody else except you understand what you mean with that specific questions. Or I'm not sure what to, an what to answer to this. So sort of debugging the questionnaire before doing it. So if you, let's say, debug the, the list of the questions that you have probably stronger and more suitable question to ask. And you don't arrive, meet interview, say, oh yes, I made a mess, I need to restart again. Let's recruit other people. So you're wasting time. So a beta testing before doing the actual interviews is always good. Uh, so here there are five examples of open-ended questions in general. Tell me about your typical day. It's a good starter if you want to understand what's happening during a day, typically. Tell me three good things about X. And three bad things about X. What has gone wrong with the application, the system, whatever it is, recently? And be ready to say what is recently. It's today, it's yesterday, the last week, last month. They want to know. And how did you cope? And something that is often do at the end of interviews is asking what else should we have asked you about? Did we miss any questions? There is anything else that you want to add? So notice this two questions here. Tell me three good things and three bad things. Why not tell me some good things? But three. Why three is better? Or four, pick a number. They have to. They are forced to think, yes, but also if I ask you, tell me some good things, you have to think, no? But? Yes, we, this is specific questions, right? Aim at direct, concrete, specific questions. Three is better. Four, pick a number, then tell me some good things. Because how many are good things? One? 100? So you can have interviews that will reply you with one thing, two things, other that will we, we tell you 10 things. And then you cannot really compare. And then you cannot say if these 10 things are all the same level of importance or not. Instead here, you're forcing to pick three things, or two, or four, whatever you want but a specific number. You can also say, tell me the three best thing about. So you ask them to prioritize. Say, okay, not everything is, out of the 10 things that are good about X, I need to pick the three that are the best one. And so you get a priority of these, and you don't have to prioritize after. And you get the same answer to the same, from the same people, three for each. And same thing is for the bad thing. So it's still an open question, three things. You can follow up to understand better, but they are specific. 
bad question to avoid. Which are bad questions to you? Let's do a few examples, and then we see that if they are here. Generic ones like? Yes, it is, is something good. This is not only generic, because also tell me about your typical day is generic. This is another problem, which is the answer about that. Is this good, what you answer? Uh, what uh, do you mean by this? Good? Let's say that I have a good explanation for that. What is the answer of this? Which is the type of the answer? Is this nice? Which is the answer? Yes or no. Yes or no? that doesn't give you a lot of information. It's a binary answer. Yes or no? So that, these are bad questions. Questions that allow that as yes or no as the only answer. And that's why a good question is three good things, whatever the definition of good. Tell me three positive things about this bottle of water. You have to pick up three. You cannot say yes, it's nice. And also, is this bottle of water nice is suggesting an answer, a property of the bottle of water. OK, this is a stupid example, but just to remain in topic. And the answer is nice. You, asking the question, think that this is nice. So which is a characteristic of the bottle, nice or not nice? You are suggesting the answer. So these are two examples of bad questions. Uh, is feature X important to you? It's a leading question, like, is this battle nice? You are directing the question on one side. You think that feature X, whatever it is, is important, or should not be important in both extreme. Here is important. The impression you risk to give is that feature X is important for you asking the question. So the other person can reply, yes, it is important, no, it's not important. And again, yes, no answer, yes, no question, so question to avoid. But this is also leading, saying that a feature is important for the person is asking. Instead, you don't want. You can ask, tell me three, the three best feature of this and the three worst feature of this and you get more information than one single question in this case. Because if this feature it's out of the three best, you already know that it's important. If it's in the three worst, you know that it's not important. Or maybe it is, but it's terrible, and you can follow up. Uh, what would you like in a tool? What would you like to see? They People that you interview for need finding are experts in their domain. They are not the designers. We have seen that there is paradigm to co-design, but even in this case, you are the, design, the main designer, the main expert for designing a system, an application, a user interface. So you cannot ask what they like to have in a tool. Also because the answer for this is a want, not a need. Similar, what do you like in X? You're assuming that there is something in X that they like. At least one thing they like. Maybe this person doesn't like it at all. But now it's forced to tell you that they like something in X. What would you do in a hypothetical situation? That's another bad question. Because you're asking people to imagine a situation in a question without giving the environment, without giving the full context of where this question happens, this situation happens. There are a things that's called imagination, imagination exercise but it's, that you can do after an interview, but it's another thing. It's an imagination exercise 
structure it in a way to be an exercise to help people imagine things with context, with everything that is needed. But in an interview where people just speak, you don't ask for imaginatory questions. Because again, they don't know. They will come up with the first things that they have in mind. You will build something upon that that is worst. How often do you do X? People are terrible in estimating things. Totally terrible. We are totally unable to estimate things. We did uh, an experiment in another course last year, and we, uh, I asked the, the students, younger than you, how many times they unlock the phone in a day. You can pick a number. Or how many hours you spend on a given application. How many hours you spend on Instagram, let's say. They give an answer, then we open the digital will bring up or the screen time apps on the smartphone, and those numbers were totally different. And not in a consistent way. So sometimes they underestimate, and some other time they overestimate. So people are bad estimating. So you cannot rely on their estimation. If you want numbers, you should look for numbers where they are in analysis, in log analysis, etc. Not asking people how many times they do X because that answer is meaningless most of the time. Binary questions, yes, no, they don't heal the motivation. They don't give you information. You want information here. Not accomplish that your question is good. Uh, tell me a story about you. Which story? What's the, what's the point of this question? What do you want to know? It's a story about my infancy. It's a story about what happened yesterday. It's a comic story. It's a comical story. It's a sad story. Which kind of story do you want? It's too generic. How do you reach a decision? Did you met? Did someone else decide without you, etc.? cetera? Uh, first, these are three questions at one. So it's it's bad for, for just this reason. But even if it's fine, here you are suggesting a response. You're suggesting that they reach a decision. You're suggesting that they meet or not. And you're suggesting that someone decided without you or not. You are suggesting possible answer. That is something you don't want because you want the, the person to reply as freely as possible without any bias, any indication of which are the alternatives to pick from. Meeting, someone else decide, and a decision was reached. Maybe the decision wasn't reached. Maybe nobody meet. And maybe I decided. Or maybe nobody decides, so the other questions that were, are useless. So avoid suggesting possible answer. And again, ask the question one at a time. Wait in silence. Okay, these are things to consider when creating a interviews. Good kind of questions, bad, kind, bad type of question, either by example or by definition. And these apply also to surveys. Um, clearly, surveys are well less cost, more cost effective, um, and the results can be easier analyzed with statistical methods because they are more structured. And also with survey, you should define which is the goal and which are the statistics, the visualization, the analysis that you want to do after the survey, something that you don't do with the interviews. The risk of survey is that they are good for a wide uh, information getting information widely, not for a deep analysis. You clearly cannot ask follow-up questions. Uh, bias data if the questions rely on the user memory, especially on sensitive issues like money, emotion, etc. How do you feel that they doing this activity from one to five? And also it's difficult to find a representative target population because you're reaching a lot of people and you want to have uh, 
if you want to analyze that statistically, you want to have a population that is representative of the, of the population in general you're interested in. So you want to have a good target population. Uh, background informations can be varied in a survey. You can also ask some of these in, in an interviews. You can ask background information, age, genders, native language, education, experience with computer, job, skill, personality, etc. Typically, in the end of the questionnaire, it's better to just keep this trivial information at the end than not at the beginning. Uh, type of questions are typically closed end in questionnaire. You can have open-ended question, but typically people don't write a lot in an online questionnaire on paper. So closed end questionnaire either with a ordinal scale from one to five or with alternatives without ordering a relationship are things that are suitable as type of questions. Uh, clearly, as measurement scale, you probably know or should know, uh, in the nominal scale, you, can, you don't have ordering. The city of residence, the gender, the color you preferred is a nominal scale information. And you can only count them or give a frequency or calculate the more that you cannot do the average of your gender of a population. The ordinal scale uh, are instead classes that are distinct, like university score from one to five, from one to five stars, thumbs up, thumb down, etc. And you can compute the median, the percentile, you can rank them, and you can order them as a kind of measurement. Uh, Interval scale are rarely used in survey, like date, hour, temperature. And you can calculate the average from this point on. And then there is ratio scale, absolute scale, like numbers, the numbers of employee, the duration of a task in minutes or in seconds, things that you can do, all other statistics, from the, including the one expressed before. And one particular kind of ordinal scale are the Likert scale that is very common in uh, human mobile interaction, but not only, that ask for the le level of agreement about a given statement uh, from one to five, from one to seven, from one to nine, and the even number of level represent a natural response. So one to five, one is bad, very bad, five is very good, two is good, four is sorry, two is bad and four is good and three is neutral. If you don't use one five, one seven, one nine, but one four, one six, et cetera, you are excluding the neutral answer. You are asking people, you're forcing people to take a stance towards the bad or towards the good. So for instance here, a four level is strongly agree, disagree, agree and strongly agree. So person should have to say I strongly disagree or I strongly agree. I agree, I disagree. I cannot be, I don't know. That is the answer in the middle. Uh, but both, both scales are quite used. It depends if you, want, if you accept, if it is acceptable for you a neutral answer, or you prefer that people take a stance towards something negative or towards something positive. Uh, even in survey, but this is the interview, if possible, use two simple questions instead of one complex one. So separate the various factors and avoid the negative words in questions, also in interviews, to avoid ambiguity. Uh, and remember all the rules about good questions, bad questions that I told you in the interviews because they apply as is in survey. Okay, so tomorrow we will speak about contextual inquiry, hopefully do an exercise, and we will present you the first assignment for the lab. That is using some of this thing. If you have any question and still here, don't forget to fill out the group composition form, and see you tomorrow.